Some of the best appraisal fairs are in retirement homes. We get to see the things that people loved and cherished so much that they have kept them for their entire lifetime. Let's go hear some of their stories and see the great things that people brought to this appraisal fair. Um, so have a seat. Uh, show me what you have and tell me yeah. a little about how you got it. I'm more interested in uh, information. This, my father-in-law was born in 1880 and uh, he taught school. He was in from uh, West Virginia. And the story goes, and this is a bell that he used, but the story goes that it started its life on a riverboat. Now, there's no markings that I could see, but I was wondering if you could just tell me something about this, perhaps. We certainly can. Now, it is entirely possible that this was used on a riverboat, but we usually call these school bells. Do any of you remember being rung to school with these? Oh, yes. I did. Yes. <laughs> and they have a wonderful ring, and they are supposed to peel very loudly like that. And that is why you might have heard a, a riverboat captain. I was on a riverboat lately, uh, recently, in Ohio, between Ohio and West Virginia, and they actually used an old bell just like that. So I believe they were used in both cases. Now, if it had some sort of a mark that yeah. was able to tell us that it was on the such and such, the USS whatever, yeah. yes. well, then it would be double collectible because it would be a nautical collectible as well as collectible for a bell. Um, since we don't have that, we have to just bear it value it based on what it is. But old school bells actually sell pretty well now. And the last one I had that size, I think, went for $75. Really? Well, I wasn't interested in the value so much as history. Yeah. And the possibility that it really could have started on a riverboat. It absolutely could have. We probably can't prove it unless there's a picture right. of someone using it somewhere. Right. Yes. But it absolutely, uh, I've seen them used in many contexts other than schools, but we officially mm -hmm. refer to them as school yeah. bells. And I would say the date is somewhere around 1890, 1900, right. approximately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Wonderful. So you'd like to do the print first or the picture first? The picture first. Okay. Tell me a little about this and how you got it, and have you ever had it looked at before? I've never had it looked at. Um, my husband brought it to our marriage. It belonged to his mother. Um, he didn't particularly care for it. I loved it. And at one time... Uh, we used it in our home, and when I came here, like some of you, I had much too many things to be using and displaying, so I took it down to the garage sale, and I have a very good friend here who, who knows about antiques and paintings and so on, and she pulled it out of the sale, put a higher price on it, and contacted a couple of her friends, and they said, take it to somebody and see if it might be a print Very or, good. or an original. Well, it's a, it's a nice piece in any event. And yes, that was wise advice because this is by Robert Wood. You notice the signature yes. in the corner and it's dated 1941. Robert Wood was an American artist and he did a lot of landscapes and mountain landscapes in particular. Uh, he was a contemporary of Thompson, who did the famous print of uh, painting that became a print of Lake Louise in Canada and such things. And Robert Wood was considered every bit uh, as good an artist. Uh, now, this piece, I believe, is a print. But what I'd like to do very quickly is... Um, so I'm going to take my jeweler's loop really quickly. And what we're looking for is dot patterns. And when we look really closely, it does indeed have dot patterns. If you think of the old newspaper newsprint, uh, that wasn't as high quality. So sometimes you could actually see the little dots that made up the picture. Well, that's uh, how you can tell a print. This one is a print. But the fact that it's a print does not mean that it doesn't have value. It's still a nice large piece. The condition's very good. You kept it well, and it's not faded. And those are all important attributes. So I would say as a print that... The value of this in the right place, which would probably be honestly like there's an antique mall in Missoula that sells a lot of Robert Wood, for example, because they're in the mountains and it looks like that here. And they would probably price this somewhere in the $135 to $150 range as a print. Okay. If it was an original, well, you know, then we might be looking at five figures because Robert Wood is a very well-known artist. So okay. I wish it was an original for you, but as a print, it's That's very, right. very nice. Thank you. Very Surely. Nice. 
Okay, very good. Well, newspapers are something we come across. Oh, and these are interesting. Okay. Yeah, those are interesting. So this is the Second World War. This is December 8th, 1941. War declared. And this is the St. Louis uh, newspaper. You're welcome to have a seat if you like. And it looks to me like there are a few. How did you get these? I just came across it with some stuff I had stashed away. Other okay. Antiques, but I think it was down at the Pike Place Market about 30 years ago or more. You got these at the Pike Place Market. Yeah, I wondered I about so. that because... Um, these are interesting, but these are actually later editions because if you see on the back, oh, really? this one has, yeah, because on the front this says Honolulu Star Bulletin, December 7th, 1941. But then if you look on the back, they have pictures of, of the Japanese surrender in 1945. Oh. So these were actually done as replicas. And the reason they did replicas of these, as far as newspapers go, Lots of people keep newspapers when there's a big national crisis of some sort, particularly when wars start and end. The ones that are the most valuable are the ones that relate to something to do with where that event happened. So the reason that they reprinted the Honolulu is because the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, which is Honolulu. So the Honolulu paper would be the most valuable as opposed to the Seattle Times edition of the same thing. A lot of people kept when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. If it's the Dallas paper, it's worth several hundred dollars. If it's any other paper, it's worth a buck or two because everybody kept them. Um, so uh, as the uh, reproductions go, there is a lot of interest in these because there's a lot of war buffs who like them. Uh, but the values are um, fairly nominal, probably around 5 to $8 per paper, and you have four of them. So probably around $30, $40. Okay, fine. Thank you. You're very welcome. Hello. Hi. This is a very pretty piece. How did this come to you? This belonged to my aunt. Oh, well, have a seat, and let's take a look at it together. And we'll show everybody else, too. So this is flow blue. The reason they refer to the flow is if you notice, it's blue kind of all over. And it doesn't just stay where it belongs. It oozes into other areas. So the design is, um, it's not exactly crisp. It bleeds a little bit. And the reason for that is that this was made using what they called transferware. Around the 1790s, they figured out in England how to use, they originally used the old tea wrappers, which is why there's so many Asian patterns. Uh, the old tea wrappers that the uh, Chinese would send tea in, they would use those and they would make decals that they could put and then they would put a glaze on top and that creates your pattern. It was a lot faster than hand painting everything. And they especially, that's where the blue willow pattern that's very famous came from. Uh, the reason that it flows is because when they first started doing this, it was a new technology and sometimes the heat of the glaze would be a little too much and it would actually melt the decal and that's why it would run. The English hate this stuff. They consider this factory seconds and right from the beginning what they did is they would fill barrels with the stuff that flowed and they would send it all to the United States and dump it. <laughs> And our people loved it. So to this day, all of the Flow Blue collectors are in the United States, and the English think it's trash. It's very interesting. Even though the Flow Blue is often more valuable now than the quote-unquote factory perfect that stayed in England. Um, this one has a nice mark on the bottom that says La Belle China, and it's got the fleur-de-lis here. And so this is going to date probably to about 1880 to 1890. And I would say by the shape that that is uh, also true. This would have been a footed console bowl or a fruit bowl to put in the middle of a table. It's a very pretty piece. What's great about it is all of this seems to be in really good condition. I don't feel or see any chips or cracks or repairs. Um, now, the heyday for collecting Flow Blue was really probably 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, the younger generations haven't picked it up yet, so the prices have been pretty flat. But I still think that you would probably expect in a retail antique store to see a price in the 145 to 195 range on this piece. There was a time it might have sold for as much as 250. 
So it's a very pretty piece, and I'm glad that you preserved it in the family. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Well, this is a handsome piece. How did you get it? Uh, it came from my wife's family. Uh, her aunt, I think, had that, and it came down to us, uh, uh, and we got it. Oh, it's very, very handsome, and it's an interesting piece. This is silver plate, and if we look at the bottom, it may have a mark. This one actually does, which is nice, so let's see what that says. Okay, this one is Darby, and it says quadruple plate, and quadruple plate really helps us date this very exactly. When they first started doing silver plate, they didn't know how long to leave it in the electric bath to get it to adhere to the base metal. And so they would usually electroplate the silver on copper, for example. Well, they did it for, uh, this is the 1850s, they are experimenting with this. So at first they left it in the electroplate bath for a certain amount of time, and they used the stuff, and in a few years, the silver would all come off, and they decided that wasn't good enough, so they tried leaving it in twice as long, and that didn't work. Finally, they came up with triple plate, which is they left it in three times as long. It did a little better, but after five or ten years, it would start to wear out again, so they finally said, well, we're going to leave it in four times as long, and that is quadruple plate, and it worked, and it adhered, and they could guarantee it would stay on for 20 or 25 years, and so that became the standard. And that's why you see quadruple plate, and that happens around 1890. So this piece should be in the 1890s. We also can see, you see there's a lot of interesting uh, work around here, little portraits, little scenes here of a windmill and a bridge and a house in the country. And that's part of what we call the aesthetic period. That starts in about the mid-1870s in the United States, where they like to do little scenes on uh, designs within a scene. Uh, the cut back into the silver gives it this brightness. I personally hate polishing, and if it were mine, I would leave it alone because I think the tarnish is nice and even, and it actually makes the design come out better. Uh, that's just personal taste. Now, silver plate again, is one of those areas that currently is not on the hot list because a lot of younger people don't like to polish, which is part of the reason I say if it looks attractive the way it is to you, just don't polish it. And some people are starting to catch on to that and figure that, oh, well, I can use this stuff and enjoy it because it doesn't have to be shiny bright silver for everyone to like it. Uh, if it was sterling silver, well, the interest in sterling silver is way up because the prices have gone up. Uh, this is a very handsome piece. It would have originally been part of a beverage set, probably with a, uh, this is a, a teapot. There probably would have been a coffee server, uh, certainly a cream and a sugar, and probably a tray. This piece by itself today, if you found someone who was matching their pattern, they would, eat, they would gladly pay a hundred and a quarter to a hundred fifty dollars for such an item. If you see them by themselves, and it's just sitting in a store because the market isn't terribly active, they might have it priced more in the $100 range. But I think it's a beautiful piece and the condition is really good. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. This is the original box. Oh, that's wonderful that you have the box. That's almost always missing. And I'm gonna let you hold her up and show everybody. This, this is Shirley Temple, <laughs> our mothers. Mother was born in 1926. We think she got this up when she was about eight. Yes, that would be about exactly the time. If you see on the edge of the box here, it says it is a genuine Shirley Temple doll. These were done by the Ideal Company. And boy, did that really help the Ideal Company. They were really struggling in the Depression, and then they got the license for these. And they loved it so much that they actually came out with new versions in the 1970s as well as the 1950s. So every generation, as her movies would be exposed to a new generation, they'd come out with a new doll, and you have the original. Yeah. And the original is the most valuable by a long shot. And what's great is you it's, she's in perfect condition. She has everything, or at least she her, looks pretty her, perfect. Her, her elastic bands are a little, are a little loose. Yes. Yeah. That. And that's typical. They can be restrung. Um, and this is the original dress. It's the original dress, and that's very important. Having the original clothes and shoes with a doll really can make a big difference in price. Um, at the peak of popularity, this doll sold for over $500. Oh.
Um, today, it's more in the 350 to 395 range. And that's only because Shirley Temple isn't with us anymore and younger generations don't have the same connection. I keep telling people, and this is this is advice for any of you. If you have a set of china and the kids don't like, aren't interested in it, take it out and have a tea party with your granddaughter. Uh, if you have a nice old doll like this, yes, maybe they have to treat it really, really gently, or you know, you can touch her hair real softly, and you have to teach them how to do it, but engage them with it. A whole lot of people. Uh, this happened in my family. My my father had uh, passed on and we had a set of china and none of us kids wanted it. We all wanted the everyday dishes. And when my mom said, well, why don't you want my china? We all said, well, it was it was stuck in the china cabinet. And you told us never to touch it. And when, <laughs> and when it came out at Christmas and Thanksgiving, we had to sit at the little kids table and you'd yell at us if we scraped, if we scratched it or dropped a fork on it. So we don't like it. And she said, oh, I didn't realize I did that. I would have liked you to have liked this. So let your kids like your stuff. Don't just keep it stored away and say, no, don't touch, because then it's nothing to do with them. So that's my best advice. But she's great, and it's really neat to see her in such good condition. Thank you. This is something that belonged to my sister who passed away about three years ago. And for some time, she was in the educational field, and she traveled to Alaska oh. to uh help the teachers teach the children up there. And these are some pieces that came to us after she passed away. Oh, these look pretty interesting, yes. This one's heavy. Okay. All right, well, there's two sort of different things here, so I'm going to show you one and then the other. This one is a uh, carved polar bear done in some sort of a granitic stone. This would have been done by one of the Inuit uh, natives. I, I always am careful not to call them Eskimos because there actually are no Eskimos in Alaska. They live in Canada, different group. Um, the uh, And it's great because when you go to the state capitol in Juneau, they have an igloo right on the opening of the door. There are no igloos in Alaska either. <laughs> uh, this one is nicely done. It's in really perfect condition. I don't see a signature. It appears that this, uh, I see a, a number on here. Do you know where that came from? No, I do Okay, well, someone put a number of $140 and the date 2018 on there. And I have to say that if we could attribute this to a particular carver, that might actually be the value. Without being able to make that attribution, I would think probably more in the $100 range is probable on that one. But then the other two are um, chitin uh, fossils that have been exposed. And it's nice because they actually, this one in particular, you see the whole critter, and that's actually unusual that they were able to carve it out that way. And then this one here. These appear to be real fossil. And assuming that that's the case, now this is something that there were a lot of these little critters around however long ago that was. Uh, but um, in spite of the fact that we see them, we don't see them in whole perfect preserved condition like this very often. So I think that you're probably looking at a similar value for the larger one and maybe in the $75 to $85 range for that one. That sort of stone is found in a lot of places in Alaska. So do you know, was she far north, like up above the she Arctic around Circle? Around Bethel. Around Honestly. Bethel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's likely where all of this came from then. That seems consistent. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Hi. This is not an antique, it's folk art, but I would just like to find out if you can tell me sort of where it came from. I like folk art, and I think I'm becoming more and more interested in folk art because these are one-of-a-kind things that you just, there, there won't be another exactly like it. Um, how did you get this piece? And it's so great that he does the gymnastics. <laughs> That's really, really fun. <laughs> and then he goes this way, too. Oh, that is so cool. How fun. <laughs> that came from my husband's family. That's just this one. Okay, and let's see. This one now, is this, riding this a unicycle. Or whatever is missing. 
so that he can ride the bike. But I'll hold him upright so he doesn't fall down. But yes, apparently he rides a unicycle, and that's really neat. I have to say, I have not seen a unicycle guy before. And it's definitely folk art. It's interesting. I mean, this... Uh, there's a little bit of cloth. The hand faces are hand painted. It looks like they took a radio knob to make the base on this one, which I think is great. And that gives us a sort of that, that plus the colors of the paint and the styles of the uh, dress that they use. There's a little rhinestone on his collar. Um, this silver paint, this is all of this indicates to me that these pieces were likely made in the 1930s. Okay, that was my guess. Late 20s to early 40s. That was my guess. Yeah. Because I can remember these little things uh, to play with, um, but I never, I can't remember what the name of those were. <clears throat> well, there were a lot of different games. There were dexterity games. There were walkers where they could actually make them walk down a plank. I'm not sure exactly what you would have called the gymnast. Um, well, the, no, I'm talking about the little pieces that he's made of. Oh, the little pieces he's made of, yeah. And they... Um, I mean, those came as uh, like a toy, because I can remember them as a child. In that era, people didn't have as much money. So people, but they had time. So they would tend to take time and make things like this instead of spending money on toys, for example. This was something that you could do and, and have fun with and make it the way you want. Uh, the interesting thing with this is that the way the face is painted, it could actually cross over into black Americana, which would make it cross collectible in that way as well. And because of that, I think this one is actually the more valuable of the two, even though this one I think is maybe the more unique of the two. Uh, but this one has a second collector who would be interested. So this one I would value somewhere in the $135 range, really? <laughs> believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And this little guy probably in the $75 to $95 range as is, because there are a lot of people now who are really interested in older folk art toys. Would he be worth more if, if, if he had the, the string or whatever it was? Well, that I mean, if he, were, if he were restrung so that he actually turned, that would, it would be a little more valuable. It's, it's something easy to do that wouldn't really affect the value that much because it would be an easy repair to make. Oh, okay. I can't do it. <laughs> well, I can't either. Easy for <laughs> easy for somebody, I guess I should say. <laughs> but that is a really wonderful piece, and thank you. I'm glad you brought that. <laughs> thank you. Looks like I brought for your lunch. Yes, it does. <laughs> when you're when I was teaching in Newfoundland, we took a trip to a little French island off the coast of Newfoundland. Oh yes. And uh, uh, thank. Pierre and Michelin. St. Pierre and Michelin, yes. And I wanted Not to... many people have ever gotten there. Yeah, it, although I've heard it's a tourist destination now. I hear yeah. it's become one because it's one of those places you would never think to go, so now people want to go yeah, there. Right. <laughs> yeah, And I wanted to buy something that would be a memory of it. And they had this shop that had beautiful tea sets, and um, I found a cup I liked, and I asked her how much, and she told me a couple of hundred dollars because it was a set. Right. And so through her French and my English, we figured out. So I, I settled on this little piece, and I've had it ever since, the early 60s. So I'd just like to find out a little more about it. Well, it is French. It's Limoges, China, and it has the mark. Uh, and it's UC, which is one of the companies in Limoges. And I, um, I believe it was, um, oh, who was, oh, I'm sorry, DC. Um I think they were one of the ones that started after the Second World War. You went there probably, I'm guessing, in around... Six, in the early 60s. Early 60s, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah, and that makes sense. Uh, the, Limoges was a very important, still is a pretty important porcelain-making area in France. Uh, but it's like saying California pottery. It doesn't tell you which company. It just tells you the area because there is a lot of, a lot of different companies in Limoges. Uh, this stone is really nicely painted with the gilding. And it was part of what was a very expensive set at the time, it sounds like. So the fact that, uh, do you remember how what she charged you for just a single cup then? I don't remember. Okay. Um, now, in the market today, cups and saucers, it has a lot to do with who made them. This isn't a company that is widely collected. 
Uh, but I had someone who had a Meissen cup and saucer recently that she got at a thrift a church thrift sale for three dollars, and it was worth three hundred. So th there's a lot of cup and saucers that are very cute and worth you know eight and ten and twelve dollars, and then there's some that can be really really something. This one is very very pretty and well made, and I think the shape of the handle is interesting. The company has not ended up becoming one that is widely sought after for the company. Um, I still think that the replacement value on this, if I had to replace this for insurance, I would think you might be looking at $35 to $45 for the single cup. Okay. It's a very pretty piece, but I really like the story. One of my favorite things about doing this is talking to all of you about where things came from because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a thing until it is part of somebody's life and then it suddenly has more meaning and that's what i think is so interesting about all this and what an interesting life you had to live in newfoundland and get to go to places like well, I, that i taught there for a year Did so you? i was at an air force base oh for yeah. a year oh very good but um i do drink tea out of it once in a while so i think that's great <laughs> i tell people much, i tell people you know make sure you put in warm before you put in really hot and then go ahead and use your stuff and okay. and enjoy it because that's what it's for Hello. Hello. Uh, this is my husband's grandmother's pencil box oh. that she took to school. And it, uh, we kids now have backpacks, but she right. had a pencil box. And it has some of the original oh, things. Neat. Well, it's a great little box. First of all, I'll hold it up so everyone can see it. It says Scholar's Companion. So this was, uh, in later years, they would have made them more as a novelty. But this is right about the time, um, uh, I imagine she went to school sometime around 1900. Is that right? Well, probably a little before that. A little but earlier. But I don't know for sure. Okay. Uh, that all makes sense. We're, the design of this is from the 1880s or 90s. And they would have made these probably up until about 1910, and school becomes compulsory in 1908. And so the focus at that point is on being scholarly. So the scholar's companion is what you would see. Now, later years, like in the 1930s, you see pencil boxes, and they largely have um, cartoon characters or ships or trains or something else, because by this time, Kids aren't thinking of, I want to be scholarly. They're thinking of other fun stuff. But in the late 1800s, there was a real emphasis on educate your children. We need universal education. We need people to understand things. So being scholarly was important. What's amazing is what great condition she kept this in. The handle is still there, and it works perfectly. There's not a lot of runs. The um, you can tell it's old because it's not as fa it's the different color. It hasn't had oxygen on the inside, so the color is a little different. This would have been the original color in the brown uh, before it went a little darker. And then all of the little accessories are just fun to have because it connects to this person. And they've got a little ruler and little pencils and a little comb and various things that you would have used and. I just think it's really sweet. There are people who collect pencil boxes. Uh, I mean, there's people who collect all sorts of school things, but pencil boxes are definitely well, never leave our a specific one. And I don't blame you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't let it leave the family either. I think you're probably looking at a value around $35 to $40 in an antique store yeah. for that. Okay, thank you. And it's so funny to talk about values with things like this because, of course, the value for sentiment and family is a real value. It just doesn't have a dollar value. So sentimental well, value. Say, that's, that will always stay in the family. Yes. Oh, very nice. Ah, well, this is interesting for a few reasons. Have a seat and tell me how you ended up with these. Well, my grandmother was the first Caucasian, uh, other than Indians, born in Nebraska. Oh. There, her parents came from outside. Oh, how interesting. She was born in a hut. <laughs> oh, yes. And oh, yes. A lot of people in Nebraska lived in sod houses, and yeah. that's how you survived the winter there. Her history is in one of the museums there. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> but uh, this is what I was really where it, it was no handle. Right. Yes, let's show these side by side. So there are two different pieces. These are both English. Now, this is not flow blue because the transfer is very solid. This one is because the transfer runs. 
Uh, this one was done by Johnson Brothers, and it says England. So that means uh, in 1891, we started making other countries put the country of origin on things. And we were mainly mad at the English at that point because they kept dumping stuff on our market to try to put our businesses out of business. So we wanted everything to say where it came from so that we would uh, consumers would be able to tell. Um, so this one is going to be 1890s. It's a very cute piece. It's a nice leaf pattern. It's probably worth about 12 to $15 today. But this piece, as you see, it does flow. It's actually in much worse condition. It has a crack. It's been re-glued here. It's got a chip or two. Uh, it's got some hairline cracks in the saucer, but it's also very deep and dark blue because this is flow blue that really flowed. The way we can date it is by just exactly what you said, that this is handleless. And that means that this came from, this came with them to Nebraska because by the time Nebraska was settled, coffee cups mainly had handles. Good ship planter is what you told me that it came from. What's that now? The planter ship. It's entirely possible uh, because these did come over by ship. And the thing is, is that until the 1850s approximately, when you had coffee, you poured it in here, and then you would pour it into the saucer, and you would drink it out of the saucer. You did not drink out of the cup, and that was to let the heat dissipate, so you would keep it in here to keep it warm, then pour it, then drink. And it wasn't until sometime maybe in the 1850s or 60s that somebody said, you know, you're burning your hands every time you do that. Why don't we put a handle on that thing if you just drink out of that? And also people started to coffee clatch a little more and they have time to let things cool down as opposed to being in a hurry. So the handleless piece is going to date back sometime around 1840. So it's significantly older than the other. Um, if it were in perfect condition, the value would be around $60, $70. Because it's fairly heavily damaged, we're probably looking at about half of that price in terms of value. But as far as being interesting, I think they're as interesting as can be. I just put one out for sale in my mall space the other day in similar condition to yours, and I think I priced it at 35 Well, I have two daughters that are fighting over it right now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, sort of coming up with another one. Maybe they could... Um, Maybe they should get together at uh, holidays and they can trade custody <laughs> once a year. <laughs> I've already gone through my thing. L, oh, that's my Linda. <laughs> Well, Susan, very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll let you choose which one you would like to speak Okay. At. I have the, the blue vase mm -hmm. with my grandmother's and the um, Japanese stolen. I'm going to say the blue vase just because we we see a lot of the Japanese dolls from the 1960s, and if we have time, we can come back to her. But let's talk about this because I have a hunch that a lot of you folks maybe have seen or have pieces like this. Okay. Now, how did you get this one? I was told it was my grandmother's. Very good. And we lived in my my grandparents' home. It was uh, remodeled and is considered a historical site now. And where is that? In Northern California. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. And yes, this does seem like something that would have come to that part of the country around that time. Uh, this should date sometime to 1880, 1890, approximately. It is, it's interesting because these are usually blown glass and there's a lot of handwork, but this one actually has the mark on the bottom of having been blown into a mold. So it was done by hand, but it was done in something that gave this ridging here. And this is interesting to me because this, uh, the reeded handle, we do see this in Victorian times, but we see it even more in the 20th century. And this base is almost onto Art Deco, even though this piece is about 40 years before Art Deco was even in style. So I find it interesting the way it's made. Uh, it was likely to have been an American maker. There were lots of these pieces that came over from England as well. Most of them are not marked in any way. But the fact that this one has this style of handle uh, and also the fact that it came to California is more likely to have been an American piece than an English piece. Uh, the enameling is, uh, you notice it's raised, you feel texture here. 
they use enamel, uh, which like a glass uh, with paint, enamel paint in suspension, and they do all the little dots. And that way, when they fire it again, so they, they make the piece, they apply the handle, they let it cool down some, then they apply these little dots, then they fire the piece again and reheat it so that this stays on. And then the final step is the gold, which is painted on. So the gold tends to wear away first. So there's a lot of work that was uh, went into these. Uh, the value on this now, um, in the 1980s when I started uh, in the business, these were selling really well because cobalt was a very popular color then in 1980s decorating. And it's funny to think, but actually antiques and vintage stuff, now that I've been around it for 30 years, I noticed that what people collect actually does comport with current decorating trends. So if Martha Stewart says, I like jadeite glass, all of a sudden people are collecting jadeite glass. And we saw that happen. Um, so I think that we, we've been away from these deep jewel tones for a while and the prices have fallen. I believe that what we're starting to see with decorating is a lot of people are starting to paint walls gray instead of beige. And so with that, a lot of cool tones and jewel tones look better with gray. I think in the next five or 10 years, we're going to see the prices turn around on these because of that. And that cobalt is again going to be a very prized color. Uh, right now, I would say your value is around $100. If things turn around like I'm thinking that they will, that might go back up to the $145 or $150 that I would have expected when I started in the business. Thanks. Now, the fact that it's associated with a historic home could give it more value if it were displayed in that historic home, mm -hmm. but they would want you to donate it. Toy <laughs> truck. <laughs> ah, yes, I saw that over there. Cast aluminum. Oh, that's great. My mom gave it to me when I was in the first grade, 1947. Oh, that's fantastic. Let's take a look. Oh, it's really cool. And it's interesting that it's cast aluminum because that was a new idea after the war instead of the cast so, iron. Really heavy duty. My dad was a med student at the time, and I, if I was real careful, he allowed me to, to pile his tech heavy, you know, Gray's Anatomy and all these heavy books. <laughs> And I'd pile them up this high, and then I'd carefully go around, you know. With the load, of course. Myself. No, that's great. So I... it, it's a chunky, strong thing that's mechanically in excellent shape. It's in amazing condition. The, uh, the paint, of course, is, well, paint gets worn because kids play with sure. stuff. But actually, I think that's really beguiling about it. I noticed it says West and KFI on the side. And, and, and my name on the front. And your name on the front. That's great, Gary. Gary. Yep. Somebody. Uh, my somebody. mother found it, a little package of decals of letters, little gold letters, in a cereal box, <laughs> cold cereal. And so I was in the first grade, couldn't spell much of anything, but she helped me say, well, why don't we take your name? And then let's just see what letters are left over. KFI was a big station, a radio station in Los Angeles. God, perfect. And so she, she made all these, and then she helped me put them on, and they're not on real straight, so I think she, some of them I put on. <laughs> but I played with this for years, and then it was just too choice to, to ever sell or think of selling or giving away. I'm so because glad it, you It just did. went to my, you know, when, you, when, when a guy gets something with wheels on it in the first grade. <laughs> It tends to stick. Oh, it's, yes. I remember getting toys like this early on, and just this was so interesting to me, and I just love this stuff. And I still love these. I think this one's just great. Uh, it's interesting because uh, the cast aluminum made me think, well, it's not going to be one of our usual. Most of them were made out of sheet steel by Tonka or Buddy L or made of cast iron by companies like Keystone. So I thought, well, let's see who was doing cast aluminum. And it says on the bottom, Pattern Service, L.A., California. This is an example of the war is over. There's a baby boom. Oh, my goodness. Everyone's having kids. We really ought to make something. You know, this is probably a company that did um, industrial patterns. 
uh, or that sort of thing in cast aluminum. And well, gee, it'd be easy for us to make toys. That'd be fun. Why not? So they went into the toy business for a brief period of time because there was such a buyer's market, just like there was a buyer's market for real cars after the Second World War because people hadn't been able to get them for a while. Uh, I think it's really neat. You do not see very many of these uh, made by pattern service at all. And you don't see a whole ton of um, cast aluminum toys in general. Uh, they just, they're just not out there that much. I think the value on this, this, this is a tough one because, you know, as an appraiser, I usually want to say things like, well, if the paint was perfect and you didn't put decals on it and all this stuff, but that's what makes this charming and interesting. So, you know, I think the way it is, is just exactly the way it should be. I would say in the condition it's in very good overall, probably in the... 150 to 175 range is where I would expect it to start, and it might sell for as much as two or 300 if the right person saw it. Yeah. It's just really cool. You know, in World War II, uh, the aircraft industry decided they learned to make casting aluminum alloys that were as strong as mild steel. Yes. In the 30s, that wasn't the case. If you cast something up like this of aluminum in the 30s, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't be have. nearly as strong. Yeah, it couldn't have lasted. And and so this this thing is it's as strong as if it was made of steel, but it's lightweight aluminum. It's really neat. It's very cool. Thank you for bringing it. Oh, yes, I saw this in your hands when I came in. And you did. Yes, and uh, how did you uh, come to get this, and what do you know about it? Well, what I know is that it was... A wedding gift for my grandparents, and they were married in February of 1906. There's Aww. no mark on the bottom. I think the pattern is called Cosmos. It is. I've seen maybe one other piece, which I passed up and which wish I hadn't. Oh gosh, <laughs> yes. You know, it's funny. When I first got in the business 30 years ago, you would see Cosmos, and you really don't anymore. If you notice looking through here, notice how opal yes. it is. It has a real opal fire to it. I don't know how much you can see that out there, but if you can see through, it looks like opal. It fires like opal. That's because the chemicals they used in milk glass until about the 1950s would cause this opal fire. And then they changed the formula. So if there, uh, there were some reproductions of these done, you can spot them a mile away because they don't fire like this. So yours is definitely the original, which you knew anyway. What's nice about this is this one is in really good shape. Cosmos was not an easy, especially the butter dome. This would have been for butter or cheese. People churned their own. It was round, not rectangular like we think of now. And so this would have been for that purpose. Now, uh, the Cosmos pattern, one problem with it is, of course, understandably, the bottom is pretty thick and heavy, but they wanted to make it inexpensive enough to ship. So the top is pretty thin. And around this edge, you almost always see chips or nicks because it's very sharp and it wasn't polished and it'd be easy to chip it when you used it. This one is in perfect condition. The paint is still all on it as well. This is cold painted. Uh, it might have been fired at a very low temperature, but a lot of these colors were just painted on afterwards, which meant that if somebody put this in a dishwasher, they could easily take the paint off. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, they must have really prized this. <laughs> I always think of it this way. Either they really loved it and took great care of it, or they were afraid to use it and never used it, or they didn't like it and it ended up in the back of the cupboard. But for whatever reason, this didn't get worn to death. Hello. This was my father's camera, um, and I think he used it during the war. Uh, let's see what you have here. Oh, okay, this is a pretty good one. I can tell already, even without knowing which company made it, because... Are you going to come out? I think so. There we go. Yeah, leather shrinks a little bit. It's working just fine. So... This is a Rolly Flex camera, and uh, you said that you thought he got this before the Second World War? I think he used it during the war. He used it during the war, and yes, that makes sense. I believe he got it in the 1930s because this would have been state-of-the-art. This Rolly Flex was a German company, and a lot of uh, the German companies started to be known in the 1930s for making really good camera lenses. So there started to be interest, and 
they came up with the idea of the twin lens. And the idea behind this was that you could take a picture and you could even uh, double print it as a three-dimensional image, but also you got more light through. Uh, you were able to look through the top and you were able to see if we press a button here, this should open. If it doesn't, I won't force it. It may be a little with age, but this will flip open so that you can see the scene and focus. Uh, it's even got its original leather strap. So it has the things that it should. And camera collectors, what we saw happen was when digital cameras came out, everyone stopped collecting cameras and the market plummeted and we all waited to see where it would end up. Well, now there's a new generation who didn't grow up with film cameras who are because they're artists or because they've heard from older people, oh, it was fun to have control over the developing or this. There is a new generation getting interested in these to use. There is also a generation that likes to just put them on a shelf and look at them because they think they're interesting looking. So there is a market for these and the twin lens are definitely doing better than the later cameras with the single lens. Uh, and so you have a pretty good model here. I sold one without the case, very similar to this last year um, for $165. And I would say that yours with the case is probably worth closer to maybe $185 or even maybe as much as $200 for this model in the right hands. Now the only question is, can we get it back yeah. in the case? <laughs> it hasn't been out for a it long time. It hasn't been out for a long time, and the cases do sometimes shrink with age. So let me see if we just, there we go. We got it, and we'll be gentle with this. Judy Mike. But this is a great little camera, and it's uh, terrific that you saved it, and I'm sure it would still take great pictures if you ever cared to. There's actually a photography store called Blazers in Seattle, and they still film for any obsolete camera ever made, including back to the big, huge plate cameras from the Victorian era. So you can actually use these still. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Hello. Well, this looks like something that I enjoy. Oh, sure. Well, you can come when you're uh, Very nice. Yes. And how did you get this one? Well, I'm trying. We grew up, as I've told some of these folks, who grew up on, in West Virginia on the main line of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. So, just a second here. Where we caught, yes. Thank you. And uh, this is American Flyer. Mm -hmm. uh, Lionel is the one you usually hear about. But we were partial American Flyer. It's a little smaller, but we always thought the de detail was better. And the other thing, it ran on two rails instead of three. So that was kind of the big debate back then when I grew up. Yep. This was my brother's, and then he passed it along to me. Uh, or my mom passed it along. He wasn't too happy about it later on. <laughs> uh, it actually had smoke coming out of it, and when it runs, uh, and you put a little bit of, uh, kind of like an oil-based uh, uh, fluid up in the front. Yep. And, yep. And uh, Yep, and it'll make smoke and the whole thing. Yeah. And so, um, but we got great fun with those. And... Uh, I know lots of people who like to do big scenic outfits. I just like to run them. And I used to work at Wesley Homes in the, the nursing home and over in Des Moines. And every year I'd get, I'd bring them down and we'd, we'd run them. And it was so great because a lot of the folks who were living in the nursing home were women. And I said, did, did you ever have one of these? No, my brother had one, but he never let me run it. Uh -huh. So... Uh, we told them that you can run it, and you can do like this to your, to your brother this time to see. So, uh, oh, I love that. And, you know, it is interesting. I have, uh, I, like was mentioned at the beginning, I do a YouTube channel, and I show things. And I have one viewer in Australia who gets so frustrated because she likes all of this stuff. Whenever I say, oh, yeah, I like antique malls that have guy stuff, she says, I like that, and I'm not a guy. Quit saying that. <laughs> and she's got a good point. It, things have changed, and um, and. That's a great thing uh, because a lot of a lot of women really do like trains and are rail fans as well. So I I, I I think that's great. You let them have a chance at it. 
American Flyer was a great company. It was part of AC Gilbert. Gilbert was the one that did the erector sets, amongst other things. And so it made sense for them to go into model trains as well. And they were a little advanced over Lionel at the time because they only needed a two rail system and they had some nice features. The detail was a little bit better. And Lionel eventually copied them and co-opted a lot of that because they realized that for the people who were serious railroaders, the American Flyer was taking away some of that market. So uh, so they tend to be more realistic. This one is what they call a, um, a, a 242, I believe, which is the wheel configuration. Uh, so it's the old uh, steam engine with the uh, coal tender, and it's for the Reading lines out of Pennsylvania. And I guess they got up into where you were uh, around where you were living. Yeah, I grew up in West Virginia. Yeah, well. yeah, they had lines yeah. in there at that point. We didn't have a television. We just watched the trains going by. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I love it. I lived in Centralia for a long time because it's such a big antique town and it's a railroad town. And I just loved it there uh, because of that. And I just love the sound of it all. Um, it's a neat piece. There are definitely a lot of collectors for these. The values are pretty good. Uh, obviously, it runs from what you just described. And I would say that you might be looking at uh, probably around a hundred and a quarter for this one these days. They used to go a little higher. Uh, there's still a lot of people interested in railroad stuff, but it's not as it's not as popular with young, young people. They're not getting train sets and things as much. Um, so now they're mainly exposed to it at Christmas time when they come out and somebody sets them up. Um, and so we, uh, but, but I also know some young rail fans too. So I think that there's always going to be interest in railroad uh, related. And I, I just think it's a neat piece and I like your story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let me help you get it back in there safely. And, no. There we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. This picture is, um, from my um, father-in-law. I think there are a lot of father-in-laws here today. Yes. <laughs> um, this was painted by Myra Sager Helm. She was the daughter of Elizabeth Sager Helm, who was a survivor of the, one of the survivors of the Whitman Massacre. Oh, how interesting. I thought the name seemed familiar, yeah. but I couldn't uh, quite place it. We have two of these paintings, this particular one was painted in 1909 for Tom's dad. And Tom's dad picked the roses and he was seven years old. Oh, how neat. And fit that. But she is- uh, So he picked them and she arranged them and, and then arranged. did the still life. Oh, what a nice memory. But what I did, and I made the mistake, and I don't know if it's right or wrong, but when we got them, it was in the, probably the eighties. And they were, and the houses always had fireplaces and food stoves. So this was just coated in smoke. Absolutely. So we had it cleaned, but I liked the other look. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really disappointed when they cleaned it because it didn't look like the original. I understand. So, you did the right thing for the painting. Uh -huh. uh, it is better to have them cleaned. And, and this is definitely something we run into a lot with old paintings and things. Um, Houses, a lot of houses were wood fired or coal fired and things did get a patina and they get, did get dark. And it's really a qu question then of personal taste. Do I like it the way it looks or is it so dark that you really don't see the image or are there chemicals in that thing that are going to hurt the piece? So you probably did the right thing for the piece. And I have to say the frame is in wonderful condition and the frame is really pretty and uh, would have been a very formal style of frame for the time. Uh, the, they were actually starting to move towards pie crest frames and that were a little simpler at that time. So this was a fancy frame uh, that really, honestly, probably was designed maybe 20 years prior to the painting being done. But I think it's just, it's so fascinating that it's got this connection and that you know why it was painted and for whom. Those are all the kind of things that they call provenance that really matter in terms of keeping the ultimate story with the piece. So I hope all that's written down. It looks like you've got things pretty journaled. And Right. And this uh, is the picture of her. Uh, let's see. She was born in eight, uh, 69. And this was, I can't remember what year this was, but th I don't know if you can see it. But she's riding a horse and she has this <laughs> wonderful 
long dress, but she was in Hood River, Oregon, and she was visiting. And uh, so she was taking the horse to go out in the valley to look at the the fruit. Yes. So, oh, but she's an neat. interesting lady. Oh, I bet she was. And, you know, the thing is, is that there's a value and then there's another value. There's there's the value for us sitting here, seeing it if it's sitting in a home and we're looking at it as a piece of art and it's on the wall and we don't know these other pieces of information. Well, then I'm probably figuring it's a nice, original, well done painting, but not by somebody that we know as a famous artist. And we're probably valuing it around a hundred or a hundred and twenty dollars. The big question with this is where is it the most valuable? And to be honest, it's probably the most valuable in the family with the story or in a museum from the town she's from with the rest of her story, because then all of a sudden there's a context to it and it makes it a lot more interesting. The problem is, is short of having it in that place, it's hard to give it that higher value. But it, I would think that for insurance purposes, at that point, you might value it more at 300 to $400. So my recommendation, since it's staying in the family, is if you have an insurance binder where they say you have to specify things over a certain age, if they're a certain age or over a certain value, then that would be the value I would give it for that. Um, the other problem with all of this in terms of, well, it'd be great if it went to a museum and everybody could see it and see this great story, is museums, for the most part, unless it's a giant museum, don't really have a budget to acquire things. So they would be happy to have it if you would only please give it to them. And so a lot, of, I get called a lot, oh, should we send this to a museum? Uh, it's a really interesting piece, and or my family's from this area. I'm like, well, yes, ask them but make sure that they're actually going to display it because a lot of museums will happily take your donation and then they'll quietly sell it somewhere for it's money because they need money to stay in business. Mm -hmm. So if you're donating to a museum, make sure you ask, is this actually going to be part of your collection or am I just giving you a donation to sell to raise money for the museum? So but it's a really neat piece everything. and I love the story Thank and I'm you. glad you brought it. Hello. Hi. My sister-in-law uh, spent a lot of time in Alaska as an educator, and she left us with some items given to it in ivory. Ah, uh, fortunately, these are the right kind of ivory, so I'll let you take them out and we'll talk about that. But first, um, can you tell me anything about the moccasins? No, I can't. Aren't they cute? They are little child-sized moccasins, and it's interesting that they're beaded uh, because we don't see a ton of beadwork from Arctic cultures. Uh, beads would have been something they would have had to trade for. And we don't see a lot of beadwork when we get up there. We usually see basketry or we see marine ivory or things that they had access to. So I'm almost wondering if these didn't trade in from another tribe, which was actually not unheard of. Um, they look like they're really well made. Uh, the the patterning honestly reminds me more of North, like uh, Montana, like Crow or Blackfeet or somewhere in the plains. Uh, and I'm not expert enough to be able to look at the pattern and just know. But children's moccasins are especially popular because they're small, they're cute, and you can put a whole bunch in a case and collectors like that as opposed to big adult size. I would say just the moccasins are probably worth somewhere in the $100 range conservatively. And then you have this piece here, which is a, uh, this is painted with the bears on the rock. And I imagine this was done by a local artist up there, uh, somebody that she knew. This is probably, when I say more contemporary, that means, well, we see on the back, it's signed Spalding 98. So this is something that was made a little over 30 years ago. Time, or well, a little more like 25 years ago. Time passes fast. That's old enough for this to be collectible. And I don't think Spalding is still with us. So I would think this would probably sell 35 to $40 potentially. Um, the knife appears to be, it's got, uh, it's got scrimshaw, but it appears to be, I know it seems strange. I'm holding it to my cheeks because your hands get calluses and you can't always feel temperature changes, but if you hold it to your cheek, 
if you if it feels a lot colder than room temperature, like I'll let you try it, put that one up and feel how cold that is, then feel this. It doesn't feel cold at all. And what that tells us is that is made out of celluloid plastic, and these are a natural material because natural materials hold the cold. Mm -hmm. So that one's probably worth about $20 to $25, the little knife. And then you have these pieces here. Now, this one was carved to be used as a pendant, fairly basic. Uh, this is probably a walrus tooth, and that's the reason for the shape. And then these are various tusks formed into other uh, shapes. Marine ivory is not the same as elephant ivory. You are allowed to buy and sell marine ivory. So you don't have the same issue that we were talking about with the elephant ivory. Now, this one was done. Um, it's got a mark that says uh, authentic native handcraft from Alaska. This would have been done about the 1980s with that label. And the value on this is probably somewhere in the... Well, it does have a signature, which helps, too. Some of the artist's signatures actually increase the value. This one is Eric Tickcor. And that's not a name that I remember, but it's a name that could probably be looked at because he worked with this particular guild. Um, I would probably estimate $75 on that one. I would say 125 to 135 on the otter because that's an unusual form. It also has a signature and it says 8740. Oh, okay. So somebody bought this one and this one apparently is older than the others and that also will help with the age. This one is a billiken. People love billikens as a good luck sign. And they're very popular, uh, actually, surprisingly, all over the country, even though it heralds from our part of the country. This one has a foil label on the back that you can't really read anymore, but that indicates this was probably done about 1950. Uh, the Billiken, because it's a Billiken, should sell for about $85 to $100. And then this little, um, oh, I think this is a Puffin. The little Puffin should sell for about 40 so overall, your collection is probably worth somewhere in the range of about 300 to 300, uh, 300 to 400 dollars. And it's, it's really a wonderful little grouping of objects and, and nice that it came from someone in the family and that you know about it. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Well, what I have is not an antique, but you mentioned yes. the 60s. Oh, this is great. I like this. And I am guessing that you acquired these things. How did you go? Did yes, you... I came out here from Wyoming in 1962 to go to school, met my husband. And the first night we met, we went to the World's Fair. Oh. And so this is 60 year old sugar. Yep. The roll penny and the dollar and the little 21 symbol. Oh, I really like it. This is a very, very uh, fun little grouping of things. I am a big Seattle World's Fair collector. I was not born yet. My family went without me. How dare they? Yes. Uh, <laughs> we were there the night it closed. And because my husband was a student at the University of Washington, they were given a lot of free tickets. So being cheap students, we went on the free tickets, and we spent a lot of time in the World's Fair. Excellent. Oh, that's just great. I sure would have if I'd been able to go. It is really neat. It was such a um, it was such a huge deal. It was the first World's Fair in America after the Second World War, the first one since New York had done it in the right before the war. And it was a huge and somewhat unexpected success. People did not actually think that people would go all the way, way out there, for a World's Fair. They were hoping 2 million people would come. I think the final total was something like 9 million. Um, it was a gigantic success. And of course, it left us this wonderful civic center. And that was another thing that was unusual with World's Fairs. Most World's Fairs were built to be temporary, like the 1909 World's Fair, which was at the University of Washington campus. And they left all the landscaping, but they tore down all but one building that they built for the World's Fair. Um, not true in the case of Seattle. So it's great because there's all these things you can still see. None of these items individually is worth a whole lot. We find them in estates around here because people went to the fair. But the fact that it's put together in a shadow box makes it really interesting. And then there's, of course, the wonderful story about 
this is our first date. This is where that we is met. The, that is a penny that we actually rolled. Oh, actually you could rolled it. Yes, roll them at the World's Fair. That's right. Yeah, they had the machines, and the sugar was free. And the sugar was free. Yes. Well, nowadays the sugar costs about five bucks. The trade dollar costs about six. The rolled pennies are about six, and this little twenty-one is three or four. But together in a shadow box with a good story. I would probably charge thirty-five or forty dollars for this if I had it in my store altogether, That's even right. without knowing you and your story. And your story is wonderful. Um, I just think that these things are really neat. The the twenty ones, by the way, interestingly enough, um, at the end of the fair, it was just Seattle could do no wrong that fair, um, unlike many of our public works projects since where we've had lots of trouble everything went really well and at the end of the fair they had all these 21 pins left and they said what are we going to do with them and this group of uh people in wisconsin who wanted to raise the drinking age to 21 said we'll buy them and use them for our campaign so you see them here and you see them in milwaukee interesting <laughs> i haven't heard that thank you thank you well, I sell through antique malls because I travel quite a bit. So I sell in Centralia Tower Avenue Antiques, and I sell in Snohomish at Star Center, and I sell at a place called Epic Antique in Seattle. And I also have some spaces in Florida because I go there and do shows in the winter. How did you get this group? My brother-in-law and sister-in-law bought an old farmhouse and this cookie jar was out in the garage, and she asked me if I wanted it, and I said yes. Oh, and that's that was great. in 1958. 1958. Oh, that's great. Well, this cookie jar was probably about 15 years old when you got it, and on the bottom, you'll notice it says patented Puss in Boots USA. This is by a company called Shawnee Pottery, and they opened in 1938 in uh, in uh, Zanesville, Ohio. I had to think of the city. Sainsville was the big pottery center then. They took over another company's um, production and started up their own thing. And they loved doing whimsy. And they liked doing lots of things that were whimsical and fun. They knew that a lot of their market were uh, families with kids. And so they tended to do a lot of things. They did a pig cookie jar. They did the Puss in Boots. There's a little creamer that they did as well. And then the salt and pepper shakers. These became discovered by collectors about 30, 35 years ago. And they went from, oh, cute things that maybe we had out in the garage and forgot about to everybody really loves this stuff and started collecting. At the peak of the market, this would have sold for over $125. Now it's probably in about an $85 to $100 range because yours is in really good condition, which matters a lot. And the shaker is probably around uh, 15 to 20. Uh, there, uh, there's a little cream pitcher that's part of the group. And I'm trying to the sugar bowl. And I think that may be everything that they made. They usually were little sets of those four pieces, uh, whether it was the owl or the pig or the cat in this case. And I just think they're really great. And I'm glad you saved it, especially then, because this would have been something a lot of people would have said, eh, now just well, she it wants it. She wants it back now, but I'm huh. not sure I'm going to give it to her. Well, you know what? Maybe you can find her one and send it along and she can feel good about that. <laughs> Thank you. I do have a question. Yes. There are at least two of us here. One is me. We have a lot of records. Yes. 78s and then the 33 and third LPs. Is there an outlet for records? There is. There's actually more interest in records now than there has been in a number of years because a lot of young people are interested. They're noticing that the sound is different. They're noticing that the sound quality is different and they're wanting uh there are people who collect for various reasons i have a friend he's well he's 30 now when i met him he was 19 he he and his dad would come up to the packwood flea market and he was very specific about what he collected he wanted northwest bands and he wanted jazz bands garage rock bands and the more obscure the better and so he he has this really interesting collection. I have another friend. He is in his 70s. He lives in Tacoma. He has over 10,000 jazz albums. All of them are by Northwest bands, including lots of little bands that or West Coast bands, I should say, including lots of little bands that just toured for a brief period of time. So where records are concerned, 
if you have Bing Crosby and they made a million of them, well, there's a million of them left and they're worth a buck or two. If you have Elvis with Sun Records, they didn't make so many of those. And if it says Sun Records and it's Elvis or Johnny Cash, those are worth some money. If it's Elvis with RCA, when he got the big contract, they made a million of them and nobody really cares because there's so many left. So it's really more about obscurity. If it's an artist who made an album that didn't sell well and then they became famous later and their later albums sold well, the one that didn't sell well first is harder to find and that one's going to be more valuable. Another thing is if it was um, sometimes you would find a, and it would say promotional copy. And what that means is that it was given to the record uh, or the uh, radio stations to play. And if it says promotional copy, well, they gave those out before the record was released. So there's not very many that say promotional copy. So those can be worth more. And then if you were rock and rollers, funnily enough, some of the rock bands, especially from the 60s, if you have, remember when stereo was a new thing and you could buy the record in stereo or mono still because maybe you didn't have a stereo. If you bought the mono record, which at the time was, oh, poor you, you don't have a stereo. The mono records are worth a whole lot of money now because they didn't make very many of them and they had different recording the practices to make the mono record than the, than the stereo record. So, so there's lots of little things to know about records. The main thing is... If they made millions and millions, they're probably not worth a lot. But if they're a little obscure, then there's a chance they could be worth a bunch. And at that point, you probably need to get somebody. Um, I think Golden Oldies Records is still around. You take. You have to take the records in to have them looked at. I think that Golden Oldies, if you have enough of them or enough people who have something, they may actually be willing to send someone out to look. Okay. I have this pen, and I have a few little notes about it. It's a Lincoln button, but it's not a campaign button because I understand that they didn't start campaign buttons until 1894 with McKinley. That's correct. Actually, they would have had ribbons before, yeah. and you wore a ribbon with your candidate's information so on it. I don't know if this was from a commemorative. I've had it for about 75 years. Well, let's see if it says anything on the back, first of all, which I don't think it does. But I think it is a commemorative, and I suspect. And how did you get it when you got it all those well, years ago? Well, my grandmother had an antique shop in Missouri. Ah, very good. And I think she always let me choose something. I don't think she was happy when I chose that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy you chose it. It says, Prover Manufacturing Company, Chicago, USA. Uh, the company that first made a lot of these buttons was a company called Witted and Hogue, and their stuff, is, they were the ones that started with the McKinley buttons. I believe that this was probably done in 1909 as a celebration of the centennial of Lincoln's birth, because when I look at the way it's made, it seems correct for a pin of that era. It seems like it has the um, lithograph and the dot pattern of that era, and that would make sense for why we're seeing a button, mm -hmm. even though they didn't do buttons when he was campaigning. Right. So I believe it's a, uh, I believe it's a centenary of his birth, and mm -hmm. uh, and they have a little bit of value. They they sell for about ten or fifteen dollars. Mm -hmm. okay. Now there are some pins from that era that are very very valuable. The one that's probably the most valuable is one with um, Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington, when he invited Booker T. Washington to come to the White House, which they're was... They're on one button. And they're on one button together. And that button is worth five to $10,000 because <laughs> uh, Teddy Roosevelt caused a real firestorm by inviting a black man to the White House. Yeah. And people were, a lot of people were really furious with him. And he said, well, our party set them free, and I'm going to listen to him about what he has to say. And they had a wonderful meeting, and a few pins were made, very few, mm -hmm. and they are extremely valuable. Okay. Thank you. Look at this, then. We come from a scouting family, and we've been following uh, uh, Norman Rockwell for ages because yes. of his involvement with scouting. Yes. And... Uh, uh, we purchased this and have it. And I was just wondering, does the value increase since uh, uh, Rockwell's demise? 
Well, unfortunately, Rockwell is one of those examples where the increase was so great when he passed. There was so much interest and the market really ran up that now we're so far away from them that the market has actually come back down some. But you do have the certificate of authenticity. This was a Franklin Gallery piece. And, you know, it's funny, a lot of the Franklin Mint and the Franklin Gallery pieces a lot of them actually have held their value much better than we thought that they would. When they first were making some of these, we thought, well, gosh, it's kind of instant collectible, and will this really have staying power? And the answer has been yes, because they made really good quality items. I sold a piece, not this piece, but a similar piece um, uh, yesterday for $95, and that's about what it sold for when it was new, and I was happy to see that it had maintained that. Do you remember what you paid for this one when you got it? I'm thinking about $35. That's probably about sure. right. And I would say that now the value, the value's probably gone up a little bit from what you paid for it. I would say around $50 is the most likely price now. Uh, because again, Norman Rockwell is not as sought after as he used to be, but the art is great. And at some point there's going to be appreciation in that Americana again. I think we're just sort of between generations on it right now. Well, we were from the scouting family. Uh, I have two Eagle sons, scout sons. Oh, that's sons. wonderful. My wife and I are both involved. I have about 55 years in with scouting as a scout. That's great. Place. And uh, oh, that's we cool. just like Norman. I love scouting. I've got to tell you, I was a Boy Scout, and I was one of those that got to first class and then decided I didn't really want to work any harder. But the reason I stuck with it is because they taught me wilderness survival, they taught me to appreciate the outdoors, and I went on 350-mile hikes with the scouts through the Olympics, including the one where you go off the trail and follow the press expedition, and it was one of the highlights of my life, I mean, to this day. So I have very fond memories of the scouts. Yeah, well, I uh, tell people I spent two years in the Army and never got out of the States, joined the Boy Scouts as an adult, and have been three world jamborees. <laughs> That's great. In, uh, uh, Japan in 1971, oh, neat. Norway in 1970, uh, four years later, 1975, and then in Australia. Oh, how great. So, I had a friend who got to go to the one in Idaho in 69. That's as close as we got. <laughs> well, that, that was, that was uh, national. That was a national, yeah. yes. Yeah, we never got to the world. But um, yeah, yeah the, uh, the best scouting experience I ever had was that hike through the Olympics. The worst scouting experience I had was somebody had the brilliant idea that we should all have a big jamboree together and they couldn't find a place to do it. So they made us camp in the grass field next to the Boeing plant in Kent. <laughs> I was there. Uh, were you? Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, very nice. That had this. When it got unpacked, someone took off the, the label. Yes. Well, that is the, uh, that appears to be the label of the gallery that had it, if I'm not mistaken, because it says right on the back. Uh, Camelletti and company. Right. So, uh, how did, did you go to Italy? No, I went to an estate sale. Ah, very good. That's a great thing with estate annoying. sales. <laughs> yes, you can travel the world without having to leave your name. But it's great. Do you mind me asking what you got, what you paid for these at the estate sale? I paid twenty five for the two. Twenty five for the two. Well, that's a wonderful price because they're really well made. Uh, these are going to date uh, sometime to the late 60s or early 70s, but they're, um, they are done as repose. So it's actually a, a sheet of, um, I think it's actually silver foil. It's, I think it tells it us here. 925. Nine yes, that's right. It's sterling foil. And then they actually uh, use a repose, which is where they make a mold and then they press it in so that the design comes out three dimensionally. Um, so they're really nicely done. And back when you got these, the price of silver was low and they weren't terribly old. So they probably just thought, well, they're nice, but who cares? Well, now these have a collector following and they're, they're just really well done. And the price of silver has gone up. The kind of work, Italy had a lot of problems, if you recall. I remember as a kid, we would always hear about the terrorism in Italy and the uh, Red Brigade. And we would hear about... Um, how they devalued their currency again. All of that upheaval meant that Italian goods were really cheap. 
for Americans. And so a lot of nice things were brought over from Italy, a lot of beautiful glass that's now very collectible, a lot of these types of pictures, a lot of wood inlaid pieces, Sorrento furniture. I mean, just tons of good stuff came out of Italy in the late 60s and early 70s, and this would have been that time. I would say that you're probably looking now at somewhere around 100 apiece for them. Good return. Good return, yes, exactly. <laughs> All the life. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is buy what you like. And then if it ends up being worth more, well, you got a bonus. Right. But I, I always tell people, start with what you like, and then you'll keep it long yeah. enough that, sure, the value will go up, but it's because you enjoyed it. Right, right. And what yeah. you got out of using and seeing it is value, too. Right. Well, thank you so thank much. You. I appreciate it. Yes. Oh, another really cool doll, I see. <laughs> No, not at all. This looks more like our fashion doll that we yes. were talking about. My sister got the baby doll, and she's 10 years younger than I am. Uh -huh. Actually, more than that, but this is all original. I don't know if you want to oh, yes. see what the body looks like. I would like to thank and, you, yes, because yeah. this body is made of kid skin, and it has yes. some things going for it. First of all, it's jointed. That was more expensive at the time, so we have the uh, arms that move, and the the Body is kid skin, but then all the uh, parts that you see, of course, are china. These are the original shoes that looks like the original dress. And I'm looking to see if she has any mark on her back, because oftentimes right between the shoulders is where I you I understood can... she was Kessner. Yeah, I believe she's Kessner as well. I was just going to see if they had a mark that we could see, but um, I believe that attribution is correct. Uh, Kessner was another good uh, doll maker of the time. Uh, there's certain things that make them a little more valuable. The fact that she has the eyes that open and close is good. The fact that she has an open mouth with teeth showing actually is an indication of a little higher value because any of those things that were a little more complicated to do made them a little more expensive at the time, and so they were harder to get, so there's fewer of them. Um, she's in great shape overall, and it seems like even the hair is original, if I'm looking at it, it right. Yeah, it looks like everything about it is the way it should be. And I think that her value in this good condition with the, um, with the regular set of clothes, conservatively probably 200 to and a quarter, and maybe for insurance purposes, you might want to insure for about 350 because if you had to replace her, Insurance companies, generally the insurance value is the highest because number one, they know they're going to get some of it back with your deductible. But number two, the insurance company, they're not going to say, well, we want you to go to garage sales until you find one for 20 bucks. They want to close your case and be done with it. So they typically will pay more figuring if you have to buy it in a hurry, it's going to cost you more. So for insurance purposes, I'd say 300. What? I understand that she's about 100 years old or so. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It was given to my mother when she was a little girl. Actually, it's a little more than 100 yeah. years old. I'd say with that body, probably 120 years old at this point, probably right about 1900. Oh, it's funny because we had Shirley Temple earlier. We did and, have Shirley Temple earlier. And now we have one of these, and it's nice because it's real. And how did you get this one? A friend gave that to me. Many, many years ago. Oh, that's great. Well, you can tell that this one's a real one. First of all, it doesn't feel greasy like new glass. They did reproduce these in the 1980s, and so there are reproductions of these around, which unfortunately hurt the market for the old ones as well. But this one is definitely old. You can see, again, when you look at the screen print, uh, you can see the dot pattern in it. Um, this was a uh, this hexagon was a popular depression glass form made by I think Federal Glass, and then they just blocked off a panel and screen printed her on there. Uh, these were given out at her movies, and so that was one way that you could get one. There also was a cereal bowl, and I think there was a third piece as well because it was the creamer, the cereal bowl, and then. Um, it wasn't a sugar bowl. I'm trying to think what the third piece might have been, but they were just supposed to be a little set that kids could use as the, at the table. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, most of them got washed, worn, dishwashed, broken a long time ago. Um, so the value on it today, probably around $25. And the only reason it isn't worth more is because she was so popular that a lot of people kept them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you all so much. This was really fun. It was just delightful to meet all of you and you brought interesting things and I just always enjoy so much seeing what uh, people have and 
and uh, I'll be here for a few minutes if you have any questions. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one. Also, click thumbs up to like this video and check the description for information about our Patreon, our memberships. We've got a lot of different levels with different perks and bonus videos and early content. Also, please do check out our website, theantiquenomad.com, for appraisal help. And we'll see you again for more adventures in the antique and vintage community soon. Bye for now.